In the beginning, there was Double Dragon. It was a modest little game that was fast-paced and replicated the smooth controls of its arcade counterpart. In this game, you had to work your way up at heart level to get more moves, like the uppercut, the headbutt, the jump kick, and even a ground and pound attack that would never appear again in any future games of the series. Like any game, there were tricky parts, and while some of them might have been too difficult for console gamers, there was nothing in it that couldn't be overcome by a roll of quarters in the arcade. There was a two-player mode, but it was non-simultaneous, putting the second player on the same solo quest as the first. There was, however, a compensating feature in the two-player B mode. It was a versus mode against either a computer or human player, and while the players could only fight against light characters, it was still a big feature that was unique to this game of the series and predated the Street Fighter 2 craze that would make this form of gameplay popular. And then, there was Double Dragon 2. The Revenge. Don't let the laid-back tone of this intro fool you. To put it quite simply, this game was the shit. There were tricks and traps, whips and bats, dynamite sticks and high spinning kicks, ninjas and clones, and knives you could throw, there were great big bullies and spike loaded pulleys, there were choppers with guns and foot sweeps were fun, high doors and breakaway floors, contraption loaded machines, fade outs and cutscenes, flying knees, guys way bigger than me, firecracker grenades and deadly falls, Christ this game it had it all. Even the two player mode was simultaneous this time, meaning you could join forces with a good friend and tackle this adventure together. How incredibly awesome is that? and you had all the moves available from the start. You didn't have to save up parts to get them like before. And then, as if the saga of Billy and Jimmy Lee couldn't get any better, along came the third installment of the series. It was to be the Double Dragon game that outdid all Double Dragon games, the trilogy to end all trilogies, in the true spirit of making each successive follow-up to a video game franchise that much better than the one preceding it. In came the legendary, the immortal, Double Dragon 3. Look at that. Even the introduction to the game exudes triumphantness, a sense of majesty and immortality. What with the depth of tone and, and those beautiful, wonderful, shining pillars and all. Oh, the wonder. The superiority. Oh, I can feel it now. But there's only one problem. This game is fucking horrible. It's fucking horrible. That's right, Angry Nintendo Nerd, this game is fucking horrible. And you know, it's not so much that this game is among some of the most horrible games on the system, because it's really not. It's more that this game is just a flat out disgrace to the Double Dragon games that came before it. And in this video, I'm going to explore exactly why. We start out with the storyline. Now in the first Double Dragon, it's a pretty basic plot. We actually see, as soon as we press start, how some goons walk up and punch Billy's girlfriend, and the rest of the adventure is spent fighting to get that girl Marion back. Alright, simple enough. Now in the next Double Dragon, we're greeted with a prologue that actually sets us specifically in New York City after a nuclear war has taken place and a bunch of crime syndicates have emerged out of the ashes. In this story, Billy and Jimmy Lee were both volunteers who took it upon themselves to actively fight against the leaders of these syndicates, and as a result of their ambition, the girlfriend, Marion, was killed. Whoa, that's some heavy emotional stuff right there. It's a revenge story. And the game makers actually drew it out for us with a distinctive comic book style before propelling us forward into the game. I mean, how could you not feel compelled to, to just rush right out and kick some serious ass? But how does it compare to the third installment of the series? Well, if you beat in the second game, you'd know that Marion comes back to life in the end. But now, in this one, it appears that the girl has vanished? Okay, apparently this chick has some real commitment issues with Billy. Either that, or they're just repeating the same kidnapping plot of the first game. But anyways, so now this person named Hiruko shows up, and you could tell she has some really bad motives. She, he, it, shit, whatever. Uh, but anyways, so now she says she knows who took Marion, and that we need to get three sacred stones of power for them in order for them to release her. Man, this old bag sure knows a lot about the bad guys for someone who claims to be on our side. Gee, I wonder how that's going to play out. Anyways, let's pretend we don't know and press on. So we start out in Billy's Dojo, where our student, Brett, 
has gotten pretty badly beaten by just one of the single weakest enemy in the game. He says, they're great fighters, but the one you must fear the most is... Is? Is? Damn it, man! Tell me now! Damn it, man! I must know! But of course, he has to die before telling us. God, what's wrong with these people? It's just like all those generic Hollywood action movies, or those old Walker Texas Ranger episodes, where the guy's dying, and he's got some important piece of information to tell you, but instead of spitting it out with his last dying breath, he gets killed by a sniper before he can say anything, because he wasted all his energy telling you about the mere fact that he had something to say in the first place. What the hell? Now I have to go through with the stupid mission. Yeah, thanks a lot, Brett. Good riddance. So we get outside, and we realize one significant drawback to this game right off the bat. The controls are fucking stiff. I mean, granted, the ease of controls from Double Dragon 1 to 2 were already a little bit on the decline since the first one was replicating an arcade game, and the second one wasn't. But in this one, it's fucking horrendous. It kind of reminds me of another popularly overrated video game with notoriously stiff controls. It's called Final Fight, where it brings you to a complete standstill every time you throw a freaking punch. Not cool. In this game, you have to be perfectly clear with every button you press, otherwise you'll wind up getting nothing. That being said, there are a couple of good strategies to remember to get you out of jams in this game. One of them is to remember that when you're sandwiched between people, the best way to get out of it is to jump towards somebody and press A instead of pressing B to do a jump kick. This will trigger a flip over move that will fling one opponent way the hell away from you and do a shitload of damage on them. When that doesn't work, try a technique that I've perfected called the backwards jump kick. They can't hit you when you move vertically like they can when you jump directly at them. So move up a bit, jump out towards one person, and instead of pressing B to kick right away, turn around in midair first, then press, then press B and kick your opponent in the back in the same direction that you came from. Abuse the fuck out of this move, all throughout the game. This is easier than doing a cyclone spin kick, though if you can manage to do the spin kick when you first meet up with enemies, by all means do it, because the enemies in this game will always fall for it. Unlike in Double Dragon 2, where the enemies would always duck any obvious jumping moves, and you'd have to press the punch button right as you're kneeling down after the jump in order to recover with the devastating uppercut. That's the one ray of sunlight in a game with otherwise horrid play control. Another big complaint about this game is that you only get one life. Well, there's really no excuse for that, but there is some rationale. In Double Dragon 2, you got a shitload of lives. And the reason was because there was a shitload of levels. Ten missions to be exact. In Double Dragon 3, there's only five levels. And in Double Dragon 2, each of those levels had more parts. For example, let's take the first level. How many parts? Let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, including the boss. And in the first level of Double Dragon 3, there's one, two, three, four, and five including the boss. So I guess instead of being more creative and expanding both the level and enemy variety in this game, the makers decided, ah, let's just cut it all short and give them only one life. Fair is fair. Yeah, well, things might be fair, but that still doesn't erase the fact that it's still total bullshit to have just one life in a freaking video game. You see, when you're making a video game, you want to make as much variety as possible for the players. Sure, the game's really about fighting, but they want to fight in as much situations and as much locations as possible. That's one of the things that makes great games, much like Double Dragon 2. But in Double Dragon 3, what you get is the exact polar opposite of gaming variety. For example, let's look at the second level of the game in China. This is the first part of that level. Just watch it for a little bit. Okay, now let's fast forward to the next level in Japan. Here's the first part of that level. Notice anything similar about it? Okay, now let's go back to the first level. Now let's fast forward again in the game to the Italy level. Noticing a trend yet? Do you get it? They're all the same! That's right, all the levels in this game are exactly the same. There's no difference. It's just the same old repetitive fighting in a wide open area, only with a different backdrop for each environment. But there's no actual difference in the physical layout of the levels. And when you move on in the levels, the only place to go is inside. Oh wow, big whoop. Now I get to fight in a big open space enclosed by four walls. How creative. 
Like the writers of the game couldn't come up with anything more interesting than going from internal to external on a Hollywood screenplay. And the worst part about it is that because there are fewer and non-distinct parts in the levels, the game doesn't actually force me to move on and use the entire screen space. So if I wanted to, I could just let all the enemies come at me and fight them all off right here on the same screen. I mean, sure, I could move on myself, but in order to do that, I'd have to actually make a substantial effort to run over there in the first place and draw the enemies over there with me. But why? Is there anything over there worth seeing? No! So why would I do it? Just to bounce off a fucking wall every so often? It's fucking ridiculous! Now, looking back on it, it is kinda easy to see what the game makers were going for by making it this way. In Double Dragon 2, you only had to face like three to four enemies in each part of the level to get to the next part. Here's how a typical part of th those levels would go. Pretty easy, right? In fact, it was so easy that basically all the real difficulty in this game lied in the later three missions where the instant death hazards of the level became the more important concern that we needed all the extra lives for. So in Double Dragon 3, you can see how they were trying to make it more realistic by cutting out all those parts of the levels and having all the bad guys just run onto the screen, one after the other, like they might do in real life. But the problem is that while they achieved their goal of making the per-level difficulty of the game go up, the very identity of the levels went way the fuck down and ended up being a true blasphemy to the way in which the first two games were designed. Now if it was simple combat difficulty and realism that they were after, then they could have designed it just like Double Dragon 1 and 2, but instead incorporated these four suggestions. One, make the levels longer. Two, keep the instant death hazards moderate and balanced from level to level. And this is my favorite. Three, require players to move on to each part of the level themselves after they've defeated a minimum and undisclosed amount of bad guys per part and have unlimited enemies run into the same part of the, the, the screen afterwards until they actually do move on. Think about how that would have played out. And of course, four, compensate the increased difficulty factor with more lives and with possible ways of earning extra men. All four of these things would have helped create a much better follow-up to the Double Dragon series and a far superior game to the enormous crap load that is Double Dragon 3. But let's get back to the shitty story. In China, you meet this guy named Chen, who's the boss of that level. Now when he comes out, he claims to be the brother of the guy that we killed in the battle with the Shadow Warriors of the previous game. But the only guy that we really killed was the last boss. The other guys just kind of came and went in arbitrary numbers. So I ask you, does this guy look anything like this guy, the final boss of the Double Dragon 2 game? Uh, er, uh, I don't think so. So the only Chin we know from previous games is a dude from the first Double Dragon. So maybe we're looking for someone like him? Is it this guy, the foot sweep dude with the swords? He kind of looks like him a little bit. Or maybe it was these guys, the flipping ninja fucks. How about these guys? Who was it? I don't know. We don't know. Oh well, screw this Brady bunch of bad guys. Back to the story. So the guy joins you, and before long you realize that he stinks. His ultra cool looking multiple kick move is even harder to pull off than Billy's spin kicks. Even harder, try keeping your cool with a bunch of Japanese ninjas swarming frantically around you. It's fucking nuts. Also, it has recently been brought to my attention that some people consider Chin to be the best guy in the game simply because it only takes one full combo of his punch move to kill most enemies and get you through the game quicker. But there's a couple of problems with that. First off, punching in general in this game is a bad idea. Punch combos usually take so long to put together that by the time you actually get into it, the enemy sandwiches you and you have to stop and walk around them just to try it all over again. Secondly, since the controls of this game are so fucking stiff in the first place, you have to be right on the money with each punch or the computer will interrupt the combo and give you shit. Unless you're using a turbo controller, it's simply not worth the risk. And with Chin, his punch move is so awkward and so weird looking that getting the timing just down is a royal nightmare. I mean, what is this stupid thing? It's like some special crotch grabber move that's designed for the sole purpose of pulling your dick off. And with Chin's height, I wouldn't doubt that he could actually do it. Do you really want to constantly jam your hands into the A button all throughout this game just to do this piece of crap? I'd rather watch a monkey poop out a long string of dog shit and then stand patiently by while it sprouts into a beanstalk of bullfuck before I do this move. What? You actually thought I would show that to you? You perverts!
practically the only thing I use Chin for is to be my fall guy when I need to get past some tricky parts of the level that I don't want Billy to take any damage from. Or to give Billy a break from the level so I can bring him back later to face the boss all fresh and new like a relief pitcher to close down the level. Speaking of which, when we beat the Japan level and get the second stone, our old bag Hiroku comes up to us and says, get this, it can now be told that I have always had the third stone. Son of a bitch! If you had the third stone already, then why the hell didn't you come up to us before and say something about it so that we could be on and done with this mission already? But if you think that's bad, well guess what? It gets worse! Even though we have everything we need, and we're now fully ready to go to Egypt to find Marion, this bag wants us to go to Italy and fight a bunch of hard-ass people there just to practice. Just. To. Practice. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this means? It means we'll be fighting a bunch of hard people, knocking them all senseless, and quite possibly putting ourselves at the very risk of getting killed ourselves. And all because this random person, she, who we he, don't even it, know, shit, thinks that we need to practice for the big battle. Practice. Practise. Practise? Is that right? Practicing? No! It's not right! Goddamn bag can't even spell the very thing that she wants us to do! I just... I don't get it. How the fuck? I mean, what the heck? I mean, I don't, I, I don't, ah, screw it, let's press on. So we go to Italy, practicing for the big fight, and when we finally get to Egypt, we've got to deal with all the dirty tricks in the game, like guys jumping at us on these tiny itty bitty little platforms, giving us hardly any room at all to fight. And at this point in the game, the computer even gets a little sneaky and employs their own little jump kick technique, where they constantly jump over each other in an attempt to knock you down and run you over to the corner of the screen, where they can basically zap the one and only life you have away from you. Avoid this at all costs. But even if you do avoid that, it's still nothing compared to avoiding the spike pits that they have inside the temple for you. Oh look, now I fell off and lost my best fighter. Not like I could have spin kicked high enough to avoid that one. And even if I would have went into them, they would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. They would have turned around and beat me off anyways. Beat me off anyways. Beat me off anyways. Beat me 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 off anyways. So, when we actually put the stones in place, we go into the room to find yet more enemies and yet a fourth place to put the fourth stone. Only this time, when the stone is put into place, it's then that we find that Hiroku is actually the bad guy that our friend Brett tried to warn us about. Ooh, like we all couldn't see that one coming. I guess the only redeeming quality in this is that the annoying old bad gets her scheme backfired and dies. Great, one less bad guy to try to take over the world. Yay, like we haven't killed a hundred thousand of them in this adventure already. Then, the next screen tells us what happened. Blah 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 blah. Apparently, if a person walks through that last door carrying less than all four stones, they get turned into dust. But hey, wait a minute. Didn't we have to use the previous three stones to enter that room with the single stone door in the first place? So apparently we couldn't enter that room because we couldn't take the stones with us in the first place. Oh well, someone had to take the fall, so better that it be that useless Hiroku than her boy Billy, who took a fall anyways on account of the sheer horridness of this game. That's right, I'm never going to get past it. I'm not going to let any of you forget. Some people move on, others dwell. I dwell. Because it's fucked up. That's what it is. It's fucked up. Okay, so anyways, what lies ahead of this? Well, basically you fight these three mummies, the last one turns into Marion, and well, this bitch is just impossible to beat. 
She does a handful of insane magic attacks that drain all of your one life away before you can even get a de few decent shots off. And before you know it, you're done for. I've only beat this game a handful of times, maybe three or four max, and there's not really much to look forward to in the end. Marion wakes up, she gets unpossessed, she doesn't remember a thing that happens. You never learn what was done to her in the first place, who did it, why, or by what means that doing so would have granted them possible world domination. You basically leave the game in a state of cluelessness that's no less than the one in which you begin, which is by my standards, a failure in the art of storytelling. So there you have it, Double Dragon 3 in a nutshell. But now for the bigger question, why have I spent so much time and energy covering it? a video game that I quite obviously dislike. Well, you see, because as sucky as a game as Double Dragon 3 was, it still holds a special place in my heart. You see, at the time I got it, I was nine. And my mind was still very impressionable. And I wasn't mature enough at the time to understand why I liked things, so instead of looking at things with a critical eye and being really connected to them, I just liked these kind of things because I was jumping on the bandwagon. I was too caught up in the hype to, of, of the mere fact that this was the third game of the series. And so instead of realizing, being able to realize how much this game really sucked from the start, I, it instead resulted in this moment from my childhood that I'm, very, I'm really deeply sorry and embarrassed about. This that you're about to see is actual footage from my ninth birthday party in 1991, where I had come up with a video game quiz game for my friends at the party, and I was acting as the host of the game for the camera. And, well, take a look yourself. Alright. Uh, all right, I got the Is that your clubhouse? Okay, are you on? Yeah, ready for the chops. We're going to do some Nintendo trivia questions, me and Daniel. Now, okay. The first question is, don't tell the answers, Lou. Okay, what do you get when you pass Magnet Man? A, Needle Cannon, B, Top Spin, C, Magnet Missile. What is it? What? Give them a little twist. I can't see it. Okay. What do you think it is? Magnet missile. The answer is C. Magnet missile. Yay okay. for Daniel! Next Nintendo question. For me. Okay, Cameron. What's oh. Nintendo's very best game? Not yet. <laughs> a. Mega Man 3. B. Double Dragon 3. C. Get out of my view. What is it? What is it? Spot right here. Wait, hold a second. Give him a chance to do it. That is the very best game. B. The answer is B. Double Dragon 3. Next to the Korea question. Hey, okay. This one's for Louie. Get over here. And again, that was footage from my ninth birthday party. Um, in case you didn't, in case it was too hard to hear, I asked two questions. One to, first to my friend Daniel. The question was, "What what do you get when you pass Magnet Man in Mega Man 3?" Uh, he answered correctly, Magnet Missile. And the second question was to my friend Cameron, uh, who you saw playing video games with me in the opening to this video when I featured Double Dragon 2, uh, the little brief documentary in the very first opening minute. Um, I asked him the question, uh, "What is Nintendo's very best game?" Uh, the ans possible answers were Mega Man 3, Double Dragon 3, and Double Dragon 2. And uh, he answered what I thought was the correct answer. It was a subjective question, but he answered Double Dragon 3. Uh, you know, looking back on it now, either one of those first two, or the f number one and number three, would have probably been a better answer. But the question itself is subjective. And the fact that I paired a subjective quest uh, question with a subjective answer with one that was more factual uh, in, ahead of it. Um, I mean, that just shows a lack of maturity then. Um, but you can't really fault me. I mean, you know, I think that looking back on it now, if anyone to make that was mistake with, I mean, obviously I should feel sorry and I would apologize normally for the person who I asked the question to. But in the case 
thankfully it was Cameron who I asked the question to because the reason why um, me and him liked, well, the reason why he answered Double Dragon 3 instead of something else and possibly having a little clash there is because me and him, uh, we really liked the Double Dragon series. We identified with Billy and Jimmy Lee, um, possibly for still superficial reasons, but we identified with them and we were both on the same page there. Um, unfortunately, it was a bad page to be on because it was stupid, but we were on the same page. So if anyone to get that answer, to get to be the victim of that question, it's best that it be him because in his mind it was the best game as well. Um, I should have listened to my friend Sean who was in the lower left corner of that screen and said that's not the very best game of Nintendo Entertainment System, but you know, obviously there's too much happening at once and you know, in retrospect I know better, but back then it's what it is and so yeah, I just want to apologize for that. Um, you know, people grow up, people get older and people get more wise and now we're better capable of analyzing things and making things better, you know. I mean, I'm not the game designer, but if I had things my way, it would be better. And sometimes it's just that spirit. It's just that spirit alone and that will and desire that's worth everything, you know. Even if it doesn't take effect, even if, it, even if these game designers who make these terrible games never, ever improve, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just something, it means something that each of us as individuals you know, know, are conscious of the difference between a good game and a bad game and good qualities and bad qualities. And that's what I'm committed to, whether it's in video games or anything that I do in life. I'm committed to make things completely worthwhile and as much worth doing as possible. And that's what these video projects are about and that's what my life is about in general. So with that, I leave you with that and thanks for watching. Hope you like this documentary slash comedy bit. Bye. I just, I just, I just, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, what the heck? Why the fuck? I, I, I... I just, I wash my hands of this game. Yeah. So better that it be that useless Hiroku than her boy Billy, who took a fall anyways on account of the sheer horridness of this game. That's right, I'm never going to get past it. I'm not going to let any of you forget. Some people move on, others dwell. I dwell. Because it's fucked up. That's what it is. It's fucked up. Okay, so anyways, what lies ahead of this? Well, basically you fight these three mummies, the last one turns into Marion, and well, this bitch is just impossible to beat. 
She does a handful of insane magic attacks that drain all of your one life away before you can even get a de few decent shots off. And before you know it, you're done for. I've only beat this game a handful of times, maybe three or four max, and there's not really much to look forward to in the end. Marion wakes up, she gets unpossessed, she doesn't remember a thing that happens. You never learn what was done to her in the first place, who did it, why, or by what means... Alright, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. Now I know that that's not all that happens in the end. You want to see what it's really like? Alright, then I guess I'm actually going to have to go back and beat this bitch again, but this time I'm bringing a little more help to the party. That's right, it's Jimmy! But keep your pants on, folks, because he looks exactly the same as Billy, just with a different color. And it wasn't until this game that they actually gave them some on-screen differentiation. Round one, fight! So here we go! And I'm going to try as hard as possible to put up a good balanced fight with her because I want this to be entertaining. So I'm not going to do the typical tricks like going diagonally up and down every time she goes in the ground or just waiting for her to come down to me, get two kicks in, and then go down forward and try it again. I don't like that. It's a cheat. It works on every boss in the game without fail, and I won't rely on it. I'm not even going to break out the nunchucks. We are going at this fair and square like an exciting epic final boss battle should happen. Although it's pretty hard to do that when she can attack you at a distance. Even when you're running the other way. I mean, what the fuck is that shit? I want to fight her on the same horizontal level, but if she can do that move whenever she wants, then what the fuck is the point? It's only going to count against me if I even try. The only chance I got is to catch her on the vertical on the way down and try to do that spin kick. That is if she doesn't duck it first! Oh, running backwards jump kick. Oh man, the damn kick didn't even work there. Oh, there we go. Oh man, I'm so lucky I missed that one. And I also want to mention the life bar I gave her down there, which reflects information I got off game facts about her hit points. 255 hit points! Now, when I was a little kid, I thought that she was invincible. I, it was like all my attacks did absolutely nothing, and it took forever. Now, I know that final bosses are supposed to have more hit points than everybody else in the game, but these are not final boss in a beat em up game numbers. These are freaking RPG boss numbers. And to give you an idea of what it's like, Consider the fact that if in Super Mario RPG you were to work your way up to the maximum experience level at level 30 and you constantly picked hit points as your one and only extra power up every single time, then by the end of it all you'd have at most 255 hit points for any given character. This means that Marion has exactly as much hit points as your character in, at their absolute maximum. Except unlike in Super Mario RPG, she isn't fighting against a whole bunch of even tougher enemies with astronomically higher hit point totals, each of which that do a shitload of damage on you with every single hit. She's fighting against you. You and your measly 84 hit points and whatever the hell your companions have managed to keep with them after they've struggled with you to get this far in this hard-ass Egyptian level. So if anything, it's like Mario alone fighting against some weak enemy in the game with 84-85 hit points. Not much of a contest now, is it? But even with the high hit points, it wouldn't be a problem if she didn't have so many absurdly easy ways to get you. She basically forces me to use that vertical trick just to get around her. And the controls suck, you almost have to triple tap the control pad just to run, and you can't stop when you want to, and meanwhile, she's flying up in the air, diving down to the ground, she gets to do whatever the hell she wants to. You're lucky if you can even manage to catch her at all. At least in the other Double Dragon games, it was a fair fight because in the first one you were fighting your equal with the same hit points, all physical attacks, and you got one chance per life. In the second one, the boss had better attacks, but that was balanced out because you had all your extra lives to work with, and the controls were awesome. Now fast forward to Super Double Dragon, and here you have another boss with a huge amount of hit points like Marion, but all his attacks are physical, so it actually tested how much he'd mastered the game. But here you have nothing on your side, and she has everything on hers. See right there, missed. Missed Spin Kick, and I moved up into her blind spot too, but it didn't even matter, she got me anyways. And of course I gotta recover from this, because small mess ups like that can really fuck up your concentration. And she doesn't even look as tough as she is to fight. Like, I know she's supposed to be an Egyptian princess who has these magical powers, but she looks like just a chick in a prom dress. Makes me wish I had that mounting punching move again. Though I wouldn't be punching her, I'd be using some other member. 
Oh, she did not like that one. She did not like that remark at all. Oh, and see, that was a jump. That was supposed to be a jump, but the controls didn't work. Oh. oh, and see right there, I went below her. I went below her, but she got me anyways. Oh, great, now I gotta run with this slow fuck. Good luck. Fuck. Oh, see, and there we go again. I was moving up. I was trying to move up out of her range, but it's not even possible. And I'm bringing this guy back for one reason and one reason only, because last time I got killed, and it was because my double run tap didn't work. So I'm giving him another chance. He's so hard to control, but if he can manage to do it, he has some of the most dynamic attacks in the game. Except that one. That's a bad one to use. I shouldn't do that again. And with this guy, I can actually jump over her attacks now and hit her if I time it just right. So this is where the real fight begins, because now that she has about as much hit points as I do, we can go at it. It took all of Jimmy's life just to get her down to that point, though when I was playing the game, I had no clue that her life was really lower than mine. But the game is not going to have that much longer, I guarantee you that. There! Right there! That was supposed to be a jumping sword strike, and I distinctly remember pressing the button right as I was going down. But no, it's not good enough. And where's the hit there? Was I just a tad too early for her? God, being in that spot didn't stop her from getting the lift on me the last time I moved up and away from her. Oh, my goodness. And again, with the dysfunctional sword strike. It just doesn't work when you need it to. Because I guess it just makes too much damn sense for a ninja to easily be able to take his sword out. And then, what the hell was that? What the what hell was wrong with that? I was even closer to her than I was the last time. God, this is so ridiculous. This is just so ridiculous. And, and, and of course, what does that do to the player when nothing sensical works? That's right. Vertical trick. Cheap vertical trick. That's all you can do. That's all you can do when shit like this happens. <sighs> Alright, you know what? I, I, I can't stand this. I can't, I can't even stand to commentate on the rest of this. It, so, you know what? Instead of talking about cheap tricks, I think I'm going to tune out for the rest of this battle and actually play some cheap trick. Oh wait, what, what? It, it's over? It's over already? Wait, hold up, pause it, go back. Pause it, go back. Oh, whoa. You gotta love the immediacy of that ending. It's like they couldn't wait to shove that wall of text in your face. Or half a screen of text and a stock photo of some Egyptian pyramids. It's not like the ending of Double Dragon 2, where you get that last hit and... Now that was a frickin' ending. But here, they couldn't even take time out to show Mary and getting up first and being like, Oh, what the heck just happened to me? You know, like any good game would do if one of the main recognizable characters got put into an evil hypnotic trance to fight you in a boss battle? Instead, you have to read about it in the paper later on like you weren't even there. Hell, why even bother with a fucking fade out? How about we just go blam blam, blam blam, blam blam, blam blam, blam. Oh, I got you. I got you there. No, 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 don't switch back now. I got you good. Go back. Yeah, there you go. I got you good. <sighs> all right, anyway, so now we're going to find out what happened with all the characters after the adventure. And I'm going to pause it here because I want to draw attention to this little sliver of text right there. Yeah, notice how even though they show a picture of everybody, they still go out of their way to list the name of each person. Like you don't know who you're playing with the entire time. It's like somebody going to be like, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't know who I've been playing with this entire time. Please, please tell me who I've been playing with. Uh, er, thank you. And here's Chen, who doesn't look anything like his profile picture in the game. Again, continuing in that great double dragon tradition of Chen's who don't look alike. And not to mention the fact that he's dead! He got killed in battle! Why isn't the ending affected by that? Replay value, hello? What, are we supposed to assume that the three stones have some kind of life-giving power that brings everybody back? Uh, well, okay, well, how about this? There's four characters in the game, there's three stones, and one of us has to live to beat the game. Alright, so how about we use one stone to bring Billy back, another stone to bring Jimmy back, 
and then the other one to bring Chin back. There, I just gave the stones some purpose in this game, besides being just a fancy garage door opener. And finally, the match winner, Ran Zhao, who supposedly becomes a Japanese emperor. Yeah, good luck being an emperor when you can't even pull your sword out whenever you want to. And who cares what happens to these guys later on anyways? I have no emotional investment in them. The only reason they joined us in the first place was because we kicked their asses. We spared your life, you helped us get Marion back, your contract's over, go home! But here's the one you gotta love the most. They use Hiroku's death to make one last ditch effort at a moral message for this game. At first it was like, she's so greedy that she didn't take the three stones with her, so she died. And now it's like, she won't be the first, nor the last, to let greed ruin their lives. So don't be greedy, kids. Yeah, you know, the only moral lesson I learned from this game is to not get tricked into playing shitty games. So it should say, you weren't the first and won't be the last to let shitty games ruin their life. So stay away from this. Or you might end up doing this. Next Nintendo quiz. What's Nintendo's very best game? The answer is B. Double Dragon 3. And then be so embarrassed about it that you gotta do this. I don't get it. How the fuck? I mean, what the heck? I mean, I don't, I... Yeah, so, um, and... <laughs> And then finally we got the final screen, and I'm not going to lie to you, this music, it kicks ass, listen to it. it. It's so good, it's so good it sounds like something straight out of Legend of the Mystical Ninja, which is a far superior game, I mean it's not even, you know what, it doesn't even, get it off the screen, it doesn't even belong in the same review as this game. Get, quickly, get it off the screen, Th thank you, thank you. Uh, I think next to the opening song, this song is the only decent thing in the game, it really is, but everything between them is pure crap. Basically, you go into this game, hearing that kick-ass music, seeing the name Double Dragon attached to it, and you expect it to be awesome. But by the time you reach the bitter end of it, that kick-ass music that you hear serves as almost a cruel mockery of the awesome gaming experience that you never had. That's what it's like playing this game end to end. And you know, I wish I could make light of it all for you. I really do. Like, I know that this review hasn't been all that funny and everything, but this game, it's just, there's really nothing funny about it. It's just a bad game, period. And I know that there are some games out there that are just so ridiculous and so silly that it's actually pretty funny that they're bad, so it's convenient to laugh at them. But this game is not one of them. Every single flaw that it has, every single inconsistency in it, is not funny. There's not a damn thing funny about it. <laughs> not a damn thing. Having only one life? Not funny. Bad controls? Not funny. Bad boss battles? Not funny. And all these cheap tricks that you have to use just to get through these boss battles? Not funny. How about not being able to jump into your spin kick like you could in Double Dragon 2? Not funny. And even practicing is not funny. It's just a lazy spelling error. And sure, maybe it's the correct spelling in places like the UK. But consider the fact that the person speaking it is Japanese. The person being spoken to is either Japanese or some generation Japanese American who's living in America. And they're in Japan at the time that it's said. So face it, there is no in-game explanation for it. The game makers fucked up. And we know this because it's not the only fuck up they made. Oh wait, Bimmy and Jimmy? How'd they make a mistake like this? Bimmy isn't even a real name! How did this happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. You see, it all started late one night at Technos Corp as they were just putting the finishing touches on this game. Let's see, they're the double dragons, there's the text, and their names are... Jimmy and Billy. Hey, what's the idea for in the game? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just putting the names in order. Yeah, we got them in the wrong order. How you figure? Because Billy's the main character, so he goes for it. Jimmy's picture's up there on the left, so his name goes down there. Well, switch him around! I got it! I got it! Yeah, I can see that. Mm. You idiot! Put it back! But I switch not the pictures you want, the names! Switch the names! Oh, it's the names you want. Fine, fine. You want just the names, I'll give you just the names. I hope this works out. It's better. Bimmy and Jilly! What kind of nonsense is that? I know what's wrong. What, genius? 
I don't know, something about them letters. Right. There's a whole pile of letters there. Any idea what it is? Well, it's a B and an I. It's the middle one. Oh, you mean those L's and the M's? And... Yeah, there's no jelly in here. Jelly's what you put on a sandwich, you numbskull. Are we making a sandwich? No. Then switch them around. Wait a minute, hold still. I'll get it. <laughs> oh, you guys are still working? I thought you was done. Oh, a wise guy, huh? Well, I didn't do nothing. Why you up? Ow! Ow, my nose! Quiet. We gotta clean up this mess. What? Why don't you watch what you're doing? But the levels is all done. And the letters? Got the letters. Come on, pal. We gotta make this fast. Then send it out already. You want I should send it out? Yes. Definitely. Absolutely. Positively. Put it out. And that is how Double Dragon 3 came to be. I decided to go ahead and poop out this review for you because, well, I was a little hard on Armake in the comments of his review, so I figured I'd make it up to him by doing a related game in his style. Now I can't promise that I'll stick to that style the entire time, but I'll do my best to make a good attempt. Ah yes, Adventures in the Magic Kingdom. I had this game too as a little kid, and I have to say that I agree with some of the points that Armake made about it. It does kind of have this feeling to it like Mickey and his pals were intentionally conspiring together the whole time to hide all these six keys to this one gate from you. They act like you're not there at first, but no, they know that you're listening in on their conversation. They probably paid somebody off to make sure that you showed up there at that time and spot in the first place. But no, on a serious note, the game was pretty hard for little kids. Some parts much worse than others. I didn't really find it that bothersome though because I knew what they were trying to do. It was obviously designed to be a semi-RPG where you could walk around the park doing stuff on your own schedule. And in fairness, they were trying to encompass a whole theme park's worth of completely different attractions in only five levels. So you gotta give them a break for that. My favorite level by far was the racetrack, and the only reason to even attempt to play this game more than once. The only parts of the game that really gave me trouble were the space level, the pirate level, and the ghost level. Now the first two weren't so hard once you figured out how to do the hard parts. But the platform jumping in the ghost level, that was definitely the most game block like moment of this game. This is the ass rape moment of the game. This is where it just pisses you off to no end. Because you take one hit on these things, you're dead. This is ass rape central. This is where you will be fucked. You can get past it, but it's it's very hard to do. But a dead, dead, dead. Yeah, I could never get past that part. Maybe like once or twice, if ever. If it wasn't the jumps alone that killed me, it was the fact that I never had enough candles to take out the books by the time I got there because there were so many enemies leading up to that moment and unfortunately young George W. Bush here just isn't quick enough to outrun any of them. I think it would have been a much better game if you could have bought power-ups in the candy stands or more candle carrying capacity at the gift shop or something in the park that would have made your character run faster, jump farther, have better balance on those freaking platforms or something that actually helps you in the levels that you have to pass. Oh, what? Uh, oh, alright, so I guess they did have something like that. But still, they weren't really character upgrades that made your guy better as the game went on. They were more like cheap gimmicks that made up for problems that the game already had. And yeah, you could use them to get past some parts of the game that were hard to pass, but still, it would have been much better if the character was good enough not to need them in the first place. Like, why can I not outrun this guy right here? 
He's an old fat tubby pirate who's not even as tall as me, and I'm a fit little kid here with a ton of energy. I mean, I should be able to outrun him. Why can I not outrun him? This is fucking ridiculous. And of course, every time I lose, Mickey's always there to wave his fucking finger at me like I'm the one who did something wrong. Yeah, you know what I'd like to do with that fucking finger? Hey, don't turn your back to me. All right, be nice. So, you know, all in all, I think it was a pretty decent game. It's definitely not a good one, but I wouldn't consider it a complete shitload of fuck a bad one. So, we'll call it kinda shitty. That'll be its official rating. But one thing's for sure, no matter how much you may hate this game, it's a piece of innovative gaming genius compared to this next shitload of fuck that I'm about to introduce to you. Mickey Mouse Capade. Mickey fucking Mouse Capade. Not even an adventure, but a capade. Actually, I'm not sure if that's a step up or down from an adventure, but if Disney's Ice Capades is any indication of what it's like, then one thing's for sure. This game is going to be as busy as fuck. Now, I haven't played this game very much going into this. I've tried it one time briefly just to remember what it looks like, but it's basically going to be my first time in years turning the game on. So, let's get it started, shall we? Where's the music? Do I not have the volume turned up on here? Volume, hello? Turn up the volume. Whoa, too blasting loud. Okay, my bad, there is no music. I just totally overestimated the game here. And by the way, you gotta love how they shorten the title here. It's like they went ahead and put Mickey Mouse Capade on the cartridge, but then once they actually got into the game and started making it, they thought over and were like, nah, that sounds too queerish. Even for a little kitty game. So, let's just call it Mickey Mouse. Name it after the main character instead. Yeah, that's great, guys. Hey, while we're at it, how about we just go back and take Metroid and rename it Samus? Or what if instead of Super Mario Brothers, we call it just Mario? Or what if we took Little Nemo the Dream Master and just called it Little Nemo? How'd that be? Or what if instead of the Little Mermaid, it was just Ariel? Oh, wait, no. Here's a good one. What if instead of Double Dragon 3, we got... Say it with me now, people. Bimmy and Jimmy Lee. Three. Yeah, you wouldn't like that very much now, would you? Alright, so the title screen's a little different and it has no music. But that's fine. I mean, it's not like... Mickey looks at you like, like a pedophilic rapist would. Because in this version, he actually is a kid himself. So it wouldn't really make that much sense if he did. Alright, fun house. Go into the fun house. No reason why we're going here, just go into the fun house. It's self-explanatory genius. Alright, so let's see. A makes us jump, and B apparently does nothing. Looks like we need a key to get on the other side of that door, so I'm thinking that's where we gotta go. Let's see, get over these snakes here. And up the ladder. Get up here, Minnie. Alright, kitties! Crap, I don't have a weapon! Shit! Fucking shoot! Oh, I can't shoot them! Because I don't have anything to shoot them with! Get out of there! Alright, good. Whew! Alright, watch out for the blue chandeliers or the ones with blue lines, because those ones fall. But the red ones don't. I know they're the easiest things in the world to tell apart. Okay, there's a star, so now we can shoot shit up. Alright. Sh kitties! Shoot them! Chairs! Shoot them! And spiders! Come on, get up the ladder, Minnie. Come on, get up. Get up the ladder. Alright, there we go. Spiders! Shoot them too! Alright, get the stuff. Hey, there's something in the window. wonder what that is. Oh, yay! What's that? I think we're invincible. Yeah, we're invincible! Alright, now we can go through the level no problem. Get in there! Get in there! No, don't go away! Don't go! Don't go! God damn it! Woo! Killed that enemy just in time. Alright, what's this? A key! Alright, so now we can go open up that door. Let's see, let's go back to that door. Shoot everybody along the way now. Now that we have a weapon. And... All right. Let's see, we got a fu oh, fucking spider. See, I hate regenerating enemies. Like we already killed those spiders, so why do they appear again? All right, screw that. Fucking kitties. 
snakes are easy. And key. Why isn't it working? Let's see, up B, down B, select maybe? No? Nothing works? Fuck. Alright, so it's the wrong key. I guess we gotta get a different key. So let's go back through the level looking for a different key. Ah, fight the same enemies again. Alright, let's see. Get up here, get the snakes. And get up here, Minnie. What are you doing? Get up here. Get the fuck up. Get. Thank you. All right. Oh, there's a bird overhead trying to poo on our heads. Notice in all these games, birds always try to poo on your head. Oh shit, there's a boss. Fuck, and there's a bird trying to poo on our head. Fuck. Get. No. Get, son of a. Oh, fuck. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it. Die. Oh, damn. Jeez. Ah. Oh. Alright, so here's the door that the key was for. It's self-explanatory genius again. Yeah, very self-explanatory there. You know what I really hate about this game? Sometimes, if you shoot at shit in the level, like windows or ladders, you'll find secret items. But once in a while, this annoying pink bird will fly in and take many away from you. And if you try to get the second treasure chest in the first level when she's gone, it will actually turn into another enemy instead of the second star that it would have given you if Minnie was there. So now, the only person who can shoot anything at the bad guys is Mickey. And even when you get Minnie back, they never give you another chance in the game to get the star that Minnie would have had. It's like, you'd think that maybe there'd be another chest laying around in the game somewhere. Like, if not in the next level or the one after that, then maybe in a level with a context where having a treasure chest in it would make some sense. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe a freaking pirate ship? But that's cool. I mean, I guess it just forces me to adopt a more strategic approach in when I'm trying to figure out... No, you know what? It's not cool. It just sucks. It fucking sucks. Alright, that's it. I've had about enough of this. I'm ending this shit right now. Yep! Aw, oh, son of a bitch! Alright, alright, I'm starting this shit over, and this time I'm getting the second fucking chest. Oh, what the heck? Dude, I had Minnie with me this time, so why did it still turn into the fucking enemy? God. What the fuck? What the fuck? Dude! The bird came from the fucking wall! He didn't even fly in the window! He came from a fucking wall! What the hell is that? How does that make any sense? What the... What? You mean you can walk back into the room? You can just walk back into the room. So to this point, the game hasn't been that unbearably bad. Just a few minor annoyances here and there. It's basically like the little kid's version of a bad beat-em-up, shoot-em-up game, where it really doesn't matter if there's a story there or not, or if it follows that closely to the context it came from. As long as there's always a good truckload of shit on the screen to shoot at at all times, the kids will be happy and stay busy. Pretty much all the game makers had to do to make this game was to take a couple of semi-recognizable characters from the movies, stick them in there, then go out back, smoke a couple joints, then come back in with a whole bunch of random shit to just throw in there and call it a game. And you know that's what they had to be doing. It's like the director of development went up to everybody and said, Listen guys, I won't tell you to do anything illegal, but if you should happen to find some weed just laying there conveniently on top of the dumpster out back, I wouldn't know what's going on if you came in here stoned out of your freaking minds. It's all just your own creativity as far as I'm concerned. And sure, maybe it's not fair to expect more of this game, since the kids won't care about story anyways. But if you look at this game objectively on the same level as all the other games that were made, you realize that, yeah, it is fair to hold it against the game. Because story is part of the game's variety. And if you're missing out on that, then you're missing out on a big part of that variety that's responsible for pulling everything else in the game together and making some sense out of it. Even Bugs Bunny's Birthday Blowout was a game much like this one, with a whole bunch of random and non-random elements thrown into it. But at least in that game, they actually explained why all the monsters were acting as they did. That's one of the several things that Adventures of the Magic Kingdom also had over this game, no matter how tough its variety was. But the one thing that it didn't have over it was play control. Yes, that's right, Mickey Mouse in Mousecapade is actually easier to control than the stupid cowboy kid who can't even do anything. And yet, this was still ruined by that stupid tag-along known as Minnie. And there's no place in the game that this is more evident in than in Level 2, The Ocean Stage. 
Now before I begin, I have to mention that this level, it is amazingly short. So short in fact that I may have to actually repeat parts of it just to talk about it. So here it is, the ocean, and as I was saying before, this is one of the shortest levels in the game, second only to the pirate ship level, which as you'll see later on, is embarrassingly short, especially for a later in the game level. Um, now, this is the first wide open level of the game, so you'd think it would be like a breath of fresh air, right? But no, it's more like a breath of fresh air, only with little bitty bits of sea shit being constantly sucked up through your nasal passageway and going down into your esophagus, that's right, not the lungs, but the esophagus, and giving you a goddamn stomach ache. Now, there's still a whole bunch of random shit on the screen, as you can see, but you want to know what's worse? You want to know what's really, really worse? There's not a single recognizable character in the level! That's right, I, I mean, you'd think they'd get more creative. Like, maybe have a big fish that pops up out of the water and shoots you back as you're trying to fight. Or, God forbid, they use the actual alligator on the cartridge cover from Peter Pan. Perhaps in the same way that you, they use the fish boss bass in Mario 3. But no, instead make way for Jumping Crab Man or a Rising Wave with little sud bubble coming up off the top. And every shittin' little thing here is out to hurt you. Now, now, I can understand the birds and the crabs and the whatnot, but why the fuck does water hurt you? I mean, I, I just, I don't get that. And even these little birds that poo in your head. I mean, poop doesn't hurt you. It's just icky. So you're saying that something that's icky can kill you. And it's not the first time a Disney game has done this. No, no. I seem to remember this game. I, yes, that one. Where you can get hurt with the backsplash. That's right. Water hurts you. But enough about unrealism. Let's talk about Mickey's jumps. Now they actually come in real handy here because he's small, the jumps are huge, and it feels like you get a little more hang time on them in this level than there was in the last one. So you can react to stuff in the air and land exactly where you want to. In fact, it kind of reminds me of another character from a more classic Nintendo game. Yeah, that guy. The hands down best jumper in the Nintendo world, no matter what these piss ants have to say about it. So you'd think that it would be an advantage in this game, right? But no, here you actually have the possibility of falling in the ocean and dying. And Minnie is right there behind you just to make damn straight sure it happens. See, there we go. If she falls, both of you fall. And even if you make the jump, it doesn't matter. Forget any kind of precision jumping like in the Mario games. The only chance you got is to over-exaggerate every jump every time. And if you meet up with enemies in the air or the slightest weird thing happens, she's a goner. And so are you! Look at it, dead, dead, dead. No. I mean, it's like you saw it in the first level where she can't get up ladders if you jump off the top of them too early, but here it actually costs you a freaking life! I mean, it's not like her following you was a bad idea, or that it couldn't be done at all. In fact, I seem to remember a game where it was done perfectly. Let's see... Oh yeah, I remember that. So yeah, the big mistake they made in this game was having her be a separate body that replicated your controls behind you, instead of being more like a shadow that's automatically drawn to wherever you happen to go. So we're about to go into the boss fight, and speaking retrospectively now, it wasn't until after I recorded this footage and edited all the footage previous to it, that I, it just dawned on me that this guy, this boss, was intended to be the alligator from the cartridge from Peter Pan who I was just complaining about. I didn't recognize him for the longest time because this is the alligator from Peter Pan. Now this guy, in my opinion, doesn't look anything like him. And what is he doing throwing bubbles at you? I mean, where in the movie did he ever throw bubbles at anybody? The, the alligator that I remember had some pretty mean attacks. See, that's what I want to see. That's the kind of fight that I want to see in this video game. And, uh, you know, this fight could have been so much better. This fight could have been so much better because this character reminds me of another character from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project, called Leatherhead, who had some pretty good physical attacks and also had a shotgun that he could shoot you with. I mean, that was a pretty good fight. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, Ninja Turtles is a beat-em-up game. That's not fair. This is a shoot-em-up game, so they can't really be compared. But no, bullshit! You know why it's bullshit? Because in Ninja Turtles, this guy had physical attack as a primary attack, the gun as a balanced secondary attack, which made for a pretty even fight. So what they could have did was take this game
So what they could have did was take this game and make his throwing shit at you, the primary attack, and mixed in a couple of physical attacks where it comes at you somehow. But no, instead, what you get is this jumping cardboard cutout that doesn't even move realistically and throws all these pieces of shit bubbles at you. I mean, what they really should have done to be non-hypocritical was make this enemy a piece, a big gigantic piece of shit who's throwing little tinier pieces of shit at you because that's basically what the game's giving you, just like the boss of the first level was. It's a piece of uncreative, redundant shit. And not to mention all the wasted space at the bottom of the screen. Oh my god! Now on one hand, it's good for this film because I can show you everything I want to make reference to right there in the bottom of the screen, but it's a bad thing for the game because the game could be using that space to do something more interesting. I mean, it's like they could have done like the Mega Man games, have you come in on the top and drop you down for the boss battle. But no, they want to be idiots and come in on the top and you stay on the top and waste all that space. I mean, this is just, this is the, this is a ridiculously piss, okay, that's it, I'm done. I'm done commenting, next level. We're going on to the next level. I, I'm gonna, I'm throwing, I'm throwing the script away for this one. Have at it. Well, with the old script scrapped, I guess it would be convenient for me just to play through the level now and let you experience it all yourself for a change. But no, at this point, that would be like cruel and unusual punishment. So I guess I better say a little something about it. Besides, if you played through enough of these shitty games, then you know exactly what happens every time they decide to include a forest level. Yep, that's right. An endless side-scrolling screen that simply repeats itself whenever you get to the end of it. Although unlike this game, Mousecapade actually gives you the courtesy of telling you when you're going to repeat it because you'll actually see the start sign again. Unfortunately though, you can't just turn back and try another path. Which means that you got to go through everything again and try to take another shot at it. And you know, it's not like it's that bad a thing. I mean, they did it in Double Dragon when you went past the two Abobos and you didn't figure out till later that you're supposed to go in the cave that the two came out of. But at least there, you could get more hearts by fighting more enemies and you kind of get used to it after a while because it's a cave. There are doorways and you go in them. So it makes sense. But here, it's just supremely annoying. And it gets even more annoying when you get farther on in the level because if you make a wrong move there, then you actually have the possibility of being sent back all the way to the beginning again. And yes, those are trees that we're walking into. I mean, what happened to the good old fashioned paths in the forest? I don't know, I thought they were good enough. If only the background was different so that we knew when we moved on. I mean, it's like, even though the game hasn't told us anything about why we're here in these levels in the first place, all the levels to this point have been at least physically realistic in the way that they're made. So, why only now break out the creativity? Oh well, I guess better late than never. It's just a little bit of a pain to get used to all of a sudden. Especially when it involves figuring out that you're now supposed to shoot at the trees themselves in order to open them up and stop repeating everything. After like, an hour and a half of wading through all the same shit over and over again. And of course, this picture wouldn't be complete without the other hallmark of a truly shitty game. That's right, it's what I call the random and improbable guess that you have to make in order to move on and relieve all this confusion. Here in the White Woods, for example, there appears to be no path to take that will get me through to the end of the level. But would you ever guess that you're supposed to shoot the tree right after the start sign? And not the first time you see it either, no, 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 because that would be too easy and too simple. You have to shoot after you've went through it all one time and happen to see the sign again. I mean, what the hell? It's like when I make it through it once and I see that start sign pop up again, the first thought that jumps into my head is, oh shit, I missed it somewhere. Damn it, now I have to gut do it all over again. Fuck. It's not, <gasps> there's that start sign. I guess I better go shoot the same tree again that I know didn't do anything the first time. Maybe something's changed for no reason whatsoever. <gasps> oh my god! It's a glitch in the matrix! So yeah, if you haven't played this game before and know exactly what to do already, then the only chance you got is to discover all this stuff accidentally. Which, it's, it's just annoying. I mean, seriously, I'd rather be playing Friday the 13th and trying to find my way through those fours, because at least there you can do the whole torch trick and you have a chance of fighting Jason, which is kind of exciting once in a while, you know? Oh shit, he's in here. He's actually in the cabin that I have to get the damn note from. Alright, whatever, maybe he won't show up. Let's see. 
Aw, oh, damn it, what the hell? Get out of here. Leave me alone, I'm not ready for you yet. Damn it, I just want the note. Give me the note. And stop stepping on it. I have to read that, you know? God, just let me pick up the note and get out of here. Give me the note. Give me the note. All right, good. Pick it up. Pick it up. Get it? All right. All right, okay, to the right and first down. Oh, what the hell, dude? What are you doing back already? I'm not ready for you. I'm trying to get the torch so I can fight you better now. Leave me alone. Damn it. Oh, son of a bitch. Oh, leave me alone. Get out of here. Get out of here, you fuck nut. All right, good. Let's see. All right, down and... What the hell are you doing back here already? That's like twice in a row and all I got is this stupid knife. It's like he knows I don't have the torch yet and he's trying to get me before I get it. Now get out of here. All right. All right, let's see. Where were we? Uh, to the right. Let's see. All right, to the right. And the next down should get us out. Oh, fucking wolf. All right, what the hell? Dude, that should have gotten me out of here. What's going on? All right, let's try something else. Oh, what the hell? Dude, how did he get out of the forest so fast into the children? What the hell, dude? That makes no sense whatsoever. All right, fucking zombies. All right, ah, oh, fucker. All right, let's try another path. We gotta get out of here. Oh, fucking wolf. Damn it, down. All right, what the hell? All right, down again. No. All right, God damn it. All right, try this one. No. Damn it. All right, you know what? I'm gonna go back to the cabin and try to retrace my path because this is this makes no sense. All right, there's a cabin. All right, now go the right and first down. Down. All right, go the right again, and then next down should get us out. What the f fuck, dude? Where the fuck is the exit? This makes no sense. It's worked for me before. Oh, I'm the fucking wolf. All right, you know what? I take it back. I'd rather be in the Mousecapade Forest. Get me back to Mousecapade. Get me back to Mousecapade. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Damn it, get me out of here. Get me the fuck out of here. Get me out of here! Woo! Oh, okay, so we're back, and it looks like we're about to go into the boss fight now. And this is actually the only decent boss fight of this game, since he puts up a good fight, his attacks are dodgeable, and he actually closes in on you later on when his life gets low. The only problem is that this is the point in the game where it starts to get increasingly impossible to get by without many stars, so I'm actually going to have to reset this and go back and get many stars. And you want to know something else that's real weird about this game? They actually bothered to put a high score entry on the title screen, but in the game itself, it's nowhere to be found. The only thing they show is the life bar and the score of the current player's game. But the whole point of having a high score in the first place is so you can see how close you're getting to it as you're playing the game, so that it's more fun and exciting as you go along. Even the shitty beat-em-up games do this. So you're saying that this game has a high score, but it can't even commit to it enough to put it in the actual game itself? And what a shitload of fuck! Perhaps if they actually lowered the gameplay space down a little bit, then they'd actually be able to fit another entry level in there without getting it on top of the gameplay. And like, do they actually expect little kids to keep this game running and actually remember each other's high score while they try over and over again just to beat the current one? Perhaps maybe at a sleepover or something. Is that what they envisioned? That would be like the most boring sleepover ever. Here's an idea of how it might look. Thank <laughs> you. 
So if you can manage to wake up from that now, we have one last level to cover. And I say last only because the actual last level of the game really doesn't interest me enough to do a full walkthrough for it. And besides, it pretty much sums up all the problems that we've seen already. But this next level is the one that really takes a cake for me. I mean really, to start out with, it doesn't make any sense. We went from the fun house, to the ocean, to the woods, to the pirate ship. But my question is, what the fuck is a pirate ship doing being docked in the middle of the woods? I mean, it's like, wouldn't it make more sense to go through the woods first, then to the ocean, and then find the pirate ship there? I mean, who the fuck? I mean, what the heck? I just, it, you know what, I guess it's one of those things you just can't think about that hard or your head will explode. I don't know though, maybe they figure that the ocean is too short to put in the middle of the game and the woods is too long and annoying to put right before it too early on and uh, y no, you know what, I was right the first time. I can't think about it, it hurts too much. It really does. So here we are and as advertised, the pirate ship is the shortest level of the game. And to give you an idea of exactly how short it is, consider the fact that the boss of this level is actually waiting for me right here on the other side of this wall. I mean seriously, if I had like a bomb and could blow a hole through the wall right here, I could walk right through it and directly into the boss fight. It's that fucking short. It's pathetic. It's so pathetic in fact, that I can actually map out the entire level for you all on the same screen. Look at that! Look at that! All four screens right there! I mean, I shouldn't be able to do that for any level in any video game. They call this a pirate ship, but it's barely even a pirate boat. I I've seen cruise ferries bigger than this. And of course, what do all these shitty games do whenever they shorten the game or the levels? Well, just ask this guy. I mean, I guess they decided because the game's only four levels long, it better be the hardest four levels ever. Only this time, it comes in the form of mini-bosses. Like if you touch these guys once, you get killed by them, so you can't just blow by everything in the level. And also, this guy actually takes more hits than the identical enemy in the first part of the level. Fucking inconsistent piece of crap! And you thought that was bad? You thought that was bad? L the boss. Look, look at this shit. He throws a barrage of fucking knives at you, some of which change direction in mid-air. And, and you know, that's not a bad thing. That by itself is not a bad thing, but there's just so many of them in such a small space that it's impossible to get up there and put up a good balanced fight with them, no matter how much life you have. I mean, really, if he's gonna do that, then again, how about they be non-hypocritical about it and have a constant wave of shit coming at you that clearly says you will get hit, no matter what. Kind of like this guy from an equally it's shitty game. Because you cannot beat the level if he's standing there. Who the fuck thought this was a good idea? Motherfucker! Seriously? Do they actually expect you to do anything here? Well, it turns out that there's one of two insultingly easy ways to beat him. If you have only Mickey stars, or you just want to sit here forever, then you can do the same technique I tried to do earlier for the first boss by inching up the ladder and getting a couple shots off every now and again. for the first boss by inching up the ladder and getting a couple shots off every now and again. But the only problem with that is that most of the shots hit the bottom knife when it changes path. So it's kind of dumb. But the other way is even worse. If Minnie has her stars, then you can actually take advantage of her bad ladder control operation by getting her up there all alone and shooting the boss without getting hit. I'm sorry, if a game has to make you rely on cheap tricks like this just to get you through it, then it's a flat out shithole of a game that wasn't thought out well from the beginning. I mean, you know how bad this is. Cheap tricks are for games that suck so bad that they really can't come up with any better creative ways to make the game fun and challenging for the player. So if anyone out there has any thoughts of what they'd rather be doing at this point than playing the game, now would be a perfect time to just let it all go. I'd rather fucking yank I'd all the hairs out of my face than fuck with this goddamn bunch of banana raincoat wearing bitch. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Really, I couldn't have. So we're finally on to the very last level of the game, and for this one, all you really need to know is this. There are multiple paths in this one, and you know how I was complaining about regenerating enemies in the first level? Well, that was embellished. This is a level where it really hurts you, because every time you jump up to a new screen, you could very well fall back down to where you came from, and bring everybody back all over again. 
So wherever you go to here has to be committed. Even if you choose the wrong path and you find later on that you have to go back and try again. Also, the annoying bird returns, Minnie's jumps become a real pain in the ass on these tiny platforms, and it also gets pretty tough to tell Minnie and Mickey apart when you have to jump around to shoot so much shit everywhere. And unfortunately, this is one of those games that really horribly missed out on an easy opportunity to have a two-player simultaneous mode because it would have helped you here to cover all sides of the room with opposite fire. And you know what? Just for good measure, let's throw one last comparison in on the fire to show exactly how sucky this game is. Good game, sucky game. Distinct characters, and the same damn characters wearing the same damn color. Awesome, underrated game. Flaming pile of shit that sucks on all cylinders. And at the end of all of this, we've finally gotten to what I believe is the last boss of the game. Or at least, I hope it's the last boss. I've had enough moving cardboard cutouts throwing little pieces of shit at me for one lifetime. Well, at least this one does throw something that kind of resembles little chunks of shit balls. So it looks like someone finally caught on to what they've been doing to us the entire game. Alright, we beat her! Now it's time to see... Wait, what the fuck? Is that... Someone I recognize? And they're actually in the right context from the actual movie that they came from? Wait, hold the phone here! So, wait, did we like, rescue Alice from the Queen or something? But, it's a picture frame. So what, the Dark Queen from Snow White kidnapped Alice from Alice in Wonderland and somehow kind of imprisoned her in this picture frame, kind of like the plot of Mario 64 but not that clearly laid out for us, and she did it so she could make us go through a bunch of random lands throwing cardboard cutout regurgitated shit at us from a variety of angles, and no, you know what? Fuck this. You didn't give us any story going into the game. You didn't give us any story at any point during the game. So you know what we should get now? You get nothing. You lose. That's right. I'm actually coming out and telling you flat out that this game should have no ending. It's hypocritical. Don't give a shit now like there's been a story here all along that we didn't know about. When this boss goes bye-bye, I want to see only one screen that simply says, Game over. Good day, sir. Now go away. You're an inhuman monster. I said good day. And don't ask me what that movie has to do with Mickey Mouse Capade. It makes about as much sense as this game does. I tried it one time briefly just to remember what it looks like, but it's basically going to be my first time in years turning this game on. So let's get started, shall we? And it's a glitch. A glitch! Glitched! It glitched. What? You mean she's not from Snow White? She's from Sleeping Beauty? You're kidding me! What? But, oh, oh man! Damn it! I tried so hard this time! So hard to make sure there were no factual inaccuracies anywhere in this film! Goddamn son of a fucker! The funniest thing about this whole project, it's not any of the jokes I made in the entire thing, it's more the fact that I probably spent more effort making this review of the game than the game maker spent actually making it in the first place. For two whole months, this was my full-time job. It was eat, sleep, and work on Mousecapade. The only way this game is not a shitload of fuck is if it was like someone's final project in like an intro to video game programming course. Alright, it's time to prove you're not impossible, you son of a fuck. Get up! 
Oh! Oh, fucker! The middle knife's getting me! Oh, fucking the middle knife gets me, even if I'm standing there. Shit. Why did I never have enough candles to take out the books by the time I got there? Good question. Interesting one. And the reason is because when I was a little kid and I, and I went through the level, I took out every single enemy along the way. And the reason I did that was because Mickey, he never tells you what you're supposed to do in that level. In every other single level of the game, he tells you, you either gotta get to Planet F or you gotta beat Panel P. But in this one, all he says is, there's 999 ghosts in the house, and they're always looking to make you number 1,000. So when I'm a little kid and I'm seeing this, I'm saying, oh shit, I better take out each and every ghost I see so that none of them could make me number 1,000. I mean, that's really what I believe. He's a, he's, a, he's a fucker. He's a stupid fucker who's trying to trick you. Our Mick was totally right about that one. He was totally right. The stupid fucker knows where the keys are, he knows what he's doing, and he's trying to trick you, little minds. All right, it's go time, baby. Let's go, let's go. Oh, one hit, that's all you're gonna get. Fuck. Oh, fucker, change path on me. Oh, fucker. Oh, fucker. What were we really watching during the woods montage? Oh, that's a good one. Um, we actually, we were, we, that was a sleepover again, my ninth birthday party, and we were watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. And we were actually laughing at the opening scene, that was the opening scene there. But yeah, I cut it together to where, to make it seem like we were getting bored and falling asleep. That was just sequential shots that my parents got of us falling asleep. And uh, I actually didn't have to modify anything. All I did was put them, put the shots in the exact order that I saw them on the tape. So that was a really good convenience. All right, come on, you son of a fuck. Let's get this on. And... Oh, fuck, I can't jump that high. Oh, my God, I beat him. Oh, my God, I can't believe I beat him. Oh, the normal way, so you can beat him. He is possible, son of a bitch. Another factual inaccuracy that I just created. My God. Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh my god, I knew that was going to happen. It's just like an infinite turd coming out of my ass, just like an endless rope. I mean, when the fuck's it going to be over? I can't stand this shit.